Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Josh Glenn, who I've known for over 20 years. Josh is a consulting semiotician, publisher of the websites High Lowbrow and Semiavox, and co-author of such books as The Idler's Glossary, Significant Objects, and The Family Activities Guide, Unbored. Josh has also just signed on as founding editor of a forthcoming MIT Press series of reissued sci-fi novels from 1900 to 1935. The series is called Radium Age, The Emergence of Science Fiction. It's so cool, Josh. How are you doing? Great. I mean, you know, the world is, is, is a horror show right now, but no complaints personally. How are you guys doing? <laughs> uh, doing fine, thanks. Yeah, and it's really great to reconnect with you um, in this virtual space, which is how we do it these days. And uh, we're yes. working, looking forward to your um, picks. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so, so Josh, yeah, we've, like you said, we might have known each other for like over 30 years. I mean, we were swapping zines back in the old Fact Sheet 5 zine day when you back when boing boing was a print a print product yeah. yeah before there before there was a web exactly and um and you've always been really interested in i mean you've always been doing really interesting publishing projects and i know you have actually reissued some old sci-fi books i'm glad you're going to do it under uh for the mit press uh and i just want to recommend that people go to high lowbrow and see your like massive recommendations of adventure novels from the 60s and just you you were like a walking uh encyclopedia of of books from like the mid 20th century thanks yeah i mean i've always been like a super reader you know ever since i was a young kid and i share with my father and my grandfather a, a kind of a guilty pleasure in adventure novels of all kinds from science fiction to spy novels to murder mysteries and at some point about five or six years ago i started thinking I started worrying that I hadn't read all the good ones. So I started just um, kind of making, getting more uh, careful about, you know, making lists of who my favorite authors were and what was everything they ever wrote and making sure I kind of checked all those boxes. And it was really just for me. But then as we do, I started thinking, well, I might as well put the stuff online and share with other people as I do this adventure. And I ended up, I've now read something like 900, named 900 of what I think are the best adventure novels of the 20th century. I'm hoping that within the next 12 months, I can kind of finish that project and do a thousand. Wow. That's amazing. So cool. And they're great. <laughs> like your, your capsule reviews are really good. Um, and I've discovered books through that myself. And since you, you reach pretty far back, a lot of them are available as free Kindle editions or on Gutenberg or other sources. Yeah. yeah. You know, you guys mentioned Fact Sheet 5. Someday I'll have to tell the story of making my pilgrimage to Mike Underloin's house. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Where he had all this stuff. <laughs> and he was, um, you You're know. You're talking to the right audience. <laughs> I know, exactly. He was doing his little capsule reviews of all the zines. And that was just a superhuman effort. Um, yeah. For those who don't know, here was a single person who was reviewing this very esoteric and very scattered and very remote, so to speak, um, literature. And he had a little capsule review and not just the zines, but he also had like um, indie cassettes and weird music stuff as well. Unbelievable. Yeah. Did that you, was a, a Bible of the alt culture before there was an internet. You know, before, I mean, there was yeah. internet before there was a web. You would get this amazing catalog in the mail, and just you could send away for two bucks and get the weirdest, amazing, most amazing things. Yeah, it was like yeah, the most exciting thing in the world was seeing fact sheet five in your mailbox. Yeah, <laughs> for me at least, well, it's like the whole catalog in your mailbox. Yeah, same same kind of thing. Yes, in internet pre internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, my, and my parents were really into the whole Earth catalog, and so that was kind of like you know I was sort of stepping into their shoes by getting into my own version of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I, some seven or eight years ago, I donated my zine collection. I had you know fifty boxes of zines or something, and donated them to the University of Iowa because they have a big zine collection there. And I was really patting myself on the back and proud of myself that people would be able to see my incredible collection. And then I looked at their other collections, and you know, Mike Underloy and uh, people like that have donated, you know, thousands of boxes of zines. To this <laughs> oh, library. man. 
<laughs> you were just like it's like the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, yeah, seen where there was this box. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, are they digitizing that entire collection? Not that I know. I mean, maybe they are. Um, I haven't checked in since I donated everything, but I hope they are because it's it's really isn't they're, they're not the only one. There are a few libraries around mm-hmm. the country that have collected zines in a smart way. But um, yeah, I hope that scholars go look at those things. And yeah, it's pretty yeah. Cool. That'd be a good I would, I'd be surprised project. if they were digitizing them just because um, libraries are kind of slow in doing that. As, mm-hmm. um, but that might be, by the way, for anybody listening, this would be a great project for someone to fund. If you have yeah. some um, philanthropic you know, uh, charity dollars that you would like to put to good use, I'm sure scanning the, the old zines would be a tremendous cultural nudge and uh, leverage that would be hard to improve. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. All right, Josh. Well, let's let's talk about your tools. The first one is a uh, heavy duty hammock that looks really nice. Tell us what it looks like, why you got it, what you use it for. Yes. Some years ago, I wrote a book called Idler's Glossary, in which I it's it's a glossary. It's of terms, but the sort of underlying philosophical idea was that you know the point of life should not be working so that you can then relax. The point of life should be idling, which can mean you know, having uh, very interesting projects, living a more varied life, not just doing one thing all the time and also taking it easy. But I'm a hypocrite idler, like you guys probably, where even though I work for myself and I, you know, have plenty of leisure theoretically, I actually spend most of my time sitting in front of my computer all day long. (laughs) So as soon as this um, shutdown happened because of the pandemic um, and my two uh, college aid sons came home to live with us. And all of a sudden we were sort of in tight quarters and we were all stuck in the house all day long. I suddenly, it occurred to me, we need a freestanding hammock. I've never owned one, um, but I wanted like a hammock with a steel frame that you could, I could have it inside in the cold weather. I could have it outside in the nice weather. It could be a nice place for people to go and kind of retreat from each other and, you know, read the newspaper or take a nap. So I did a lot of research, and these um, this company, Vivere, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, V-I-V-E-R-E, um, was, came really well recommended. The um, users are, all love their stuff. They have really good customer support, supposedly. The Camics last forever, so I went out on a limb and bought one for 130 bucks, I guess. And I've been very, very happy with it so far. They're, the hammock itself is about nine feet long i'm six foot two so you need you know you need a couple extra feet on either end to be comfortable um they come in different sizes i think i got the large i got one that went up to 450 pounds so that means that basically me and my wife and our dog could all be in the hammock if we wanted to (laughs) cool Um, is it comfy when you're all in there at once (laughs) we have not all three been in there at once yet but it is very comfortable it, and you can get, they have sort of cotton, they have more like polyester, depending if you're planning to kind of take care of it and bring it inside at night, or if you want to leave it out all year round, you can kind of get different fabrics. I got cotton, um, but it's super sturdy. The um, the ropes at the end are uh, nylon instead of cotton, so I think that helps it last longer, but the hammock itself is cotton. They're very, they have a lot of different um, styles, like colors, uh, color patterns, so to choose from, so that's really nice. And uh, it's really easy to assemble and it's really easy to disassemble and it's kind of portable. So it comes with the bag. You can bring it with you to the beach or whatever. Now online, I hear that people, a lot of people who have trouble sleeping, whether because they're going through menopause or they have some kind of physical discomfort, um, sleep in these hammocks. I have not tried that. They're not, it doesn't have the a kind of wooden bar either end that would keep it stretched flat. It definitely mm-hmm. folds around you. So you even if you sleep diagonally, it's a little bit like being in a mummy bag, which I don't think I would like. But apparently... Mm-hmm it's comfortable enough and sturdy enough and um, durable enough for people to actually use it as a bed. So it's pretty cool. So has it helped you idle? You know, just today, Kevin, I was sitting here on my computer at three 30. I could have stopped working, but you know, normally I, I would tell myself I should stop working at three 30. If I have nothing else I have to do that day, especially on a Friday. But usually I just keep, you know, piddling away at some project or another. But I looked out of my window because now I'm here at home and I'm in my kid's old playroom until the until we can go back to our office. And, uh, you know, there's the hammock was like beckoning to me from the backyard. And so I went out there and I got into it and it was in the shade and I was reading the paper for a minute. And next thing I knew, I had fallen asleep and the 
apparently the earth rotates around the sun i've heard <laughs> so the sun crept up on me and i was in full blazing sunlight and sweating and very confused and if i sound confused right now it's because I, ju- I just woke up from a nap but yes it's working it's working it's magic that's really because i'm a big believer in taking breaks sabbatical slack inefficiency um you know procrastination idling i, I think there's hugely uh underrated as as a as a what's the word, as an engine of yeah. um, being productive and creative later on. Yeah, yeah. Henry Miller had a great line in um, the Tropic of Capricorn, maybe, about how this was throwaway sentence about how he had just taken a nap and he woke up with enough ideas to last him for a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, I love it. So, when yeah. you're in the hammock, what are you generally doing? Are you like reading adventure novels? Is that? <laughs> I like to do the New York. I save the the hard New York Times crossword puzzles from. I, I subscribe to the the print version of the Times, mm-hmm. so I get the Thursday and Friday and Saturday puzzles, and I just stick them in a drawer, um, mm-hmm. and they pile up like a crazy person. And then um, I used to use them mostly for when I would travel because it's a great thing to do. Like when you're when you first get onto an airplane. Uh, and everybody's still loading in. You're kind of anxious and you're trapped there and you haven't taken off yet. Mm-hmm. What, what can you do? I like to um, do a crossword puzzle. So that's what I usually save them for. But now, of course, this pandemic is happening. So they're really piling up. I'm not traveling. <laughs> so I, I do crosswords in the hammock. Uh-huh. When you're reading a venture novel, is that play or idling? <laughs> or, or, is, or is it work? <laughs> it's not definitely not work. Okay. For me, it still feels like a guilty pleasure. That's probably why I like doing it so much. I sort of always feel like I shouldn't be reading these. Like if I'm going to take time off from everything else I'm doing to read a book, it should be like a you know a important work of contemporary fiction, which I almost never read anymore. It's just <laughs> it's all about oh, there's this there was another you know female uh, great mystery writer from the 30s that no one's heard about, and I just got all ten of her books came to me from ABE, so I got to read those obviously first. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that kind of I have a lot of big huge piles of. I discovered, oh, a Nigerian science fiction author. I got to read all of those now. Oh, wow. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. All right, Joshua, what do you have next on your uh, list of tools to talk about? Um, I wanted to talk about Ex Libris Anonymous, speaking of old, old books. Um, so I actually am a little bit against the idea of, like, when you go on Etsy and you you see a lot of people using um, old books to make, like, you know, book safes and, you know, mm-hmm. journals and things out of or uh, you know, just cutting off the cover and turning into something to hang on your wall. I find that a little bit bothersome because I like old books and I think people should read those books, not just cut them up. Right. On the other hand, there's a lot of books out there that are just going to waste and they're kind of trash and no one's going to buy them and they're just cluttering up you know, uh, thrift stores. So there's this um, service called Ex Libris Anonymous that buys up all these old books with kind of charismatic covers and mm-hmm. cuts the spine off throws away you know half of the pages inside and then spiral bounds the cover and some of the pages left over with some blank kind of um you know almost like waste paper mm-hmm. and here's the thing about journals and i'm sure you guys are maybe can relate to this um i really like having you know cool looking journal and i know that you're always talking about moleskine on the show mark but uh, mm-hmm. i have our time writing in those things because they're so nice and right. I get that kind of I get that blank page. Yeah, they're precious. I get that kind of blank page, um, frozen fear. Um, I can't. I don't know. Like, what would be worth putting into this awesome journal that I got? Um, that's you know, that's going to live up to the kind of cover. And these are just trashed. You know what I mean? They're 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 all beaten up already. The insides are kind of junky. But you know, there's all these nice blank pages intermixed with kind of pages from the book itself. And they they're because they're kind of old Tom Swift novels and. Um, medical textbooks and, you know, kids books and everything, German, you know, books. It's really uh, an amazing kind of assortment of books, covers they have there. They kind of look great on your desk too. And so I like to get like 10 or 12 of them at a time and just kind of put them all around the house so that whenever inspiration strikes, I'll have a journal that I don't really care about writing in. And, you know, I don't care when I use it up and throw it away because it felt like it was something that was going to be thrown away anyway. Is there an advantage to having some of the remnant pages existing next to the blank pages? I mean, efficiency wise, no, it's taking up space that you could have more blank pages in. Um, But there is something kind of fun about that too, where you just sort of feel like it's not exactly a, a blank journal where you, Mm. it's your your responsibility to fill every page. You know what I mean? There's something kind of psychologically liberating. I think, I don't think it was the intention of this person, but that's how it works on me. When I kind of flip through these books, I only have to fill about half the pages. <laughs> <laughs> the other half are already done. 
Oh, it's perfect for idlers. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Half the work. Okay. Yeah. They're really cool. I actually have one that's like an old science textbook. And, oh, from, uh, yeah, from these I guys. I love it. Yeah. It's really yeah, nice. Yeah, well, so... But see, now that means that you're that you're not doing it right. You should have already filled it up a long time ago and you'd be on to like your 10th one by now. So exactly. you need to buy a bunch of them. If, I think if you just have one, it's going to feel too precious. Right. So buy, I say buy a whole box of them. They're mm -hmm. pretty cheap. Just have a lot of them and then you won't care. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's okay. a good idea. Um, and I liked the, the filler pages are actually really interesting looking. They had nice illustrations and stuff. You can kind of even use them as prompts. I was, uh, that's yeah. what I thought. I think so. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting, yeah. Read, read something I, and you'd react to it in some way and it would provoke something. I like that. I yeah. One of the novels, one of the ones I got recently was um, a hardcover edition of R Robert Heinlein's Farn Holmes Freehold, which mm -hmm. is like Heinlein at his like – sexually skeeviest and grossest and like <laughs> most libertarian it's uh -huh. like all the things about highlands like his worst one of his worst books probably and there's something really enjoyable about the a the illicit thrill like reading some of the pages but i couldn't read all of it because it's not all in there <laughs> uh -huh. and sort of feeling like fuck you robert highland like i'm gonna use i'm using your book as a journal <laughs> <inside> <laughs> of the book. I don't know. there's something kind yeah. of amazing about that one that's really funny um i uh have I never been able to really enjoy Heinlein's books. Even Stranger in a Strange Land, I like. I abandoned it about seventy percent of the way through. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean that one's. I mean that one's kind of an amazing period piece, but it's totally overrated. It was just kind of a cult thing at the time. But yeah. uh, what I really like of Heinlein is his juveniles in the fifties. Kevin is going to know what I'm talking about. In never the 1950s, them, no. Oh, in the 1950s, Heinlein kind of invented YA science fiction. Like nobody was writing sci-fi novels for kids. And so he wrote, um, you know, uh, have space suit, have space suit will travel and red Mars. Okay. And right. he was kind of rehearsing all of his themes that would come up in his adult novels, but they're really fun kind of kids books or young cool. adult books. Is Starship Troopers considered one of those? That's No, I don't think so. That's a later one, but that is, you know, I, in some ways, I think the movie's better than the book in that case, but it is a good story for sure. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, we should make a list of, of of science fiction movies that are better than the book. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a well, few. Minority Report actually is one. It was just a short story of um mm. of Dicks. Silver Cave Dick. It was a sketch. It was a vignette, and um, because I worked on that with Spielberg, and I thought if if he can make a movie from this little sketch, they can make a movie from anything. Uh, wow. mm -hmm. There was really not very much there, and it wasn't really that interesting. I, and I never really, I mean, had some genius in, in seeing that there was some potential there that yeah. normal mortals the, would not have. The mise en scène of that movie, the whole way that he manipulates the screens in front of him mm -hmm. um, with, the, with those gloves and the little wooden ball mm -hmm. and all that comes out is just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the part that we worked on. Yeah. Oh, no way. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so science fiction and, uh, these, th these are great little, um, ways to these books, these little, um, um, journals. Do you have, you have another, um, tool that you, um, are a favorite of? Yeah. So my sons, my college age sons, who I mentioned to move home with me during the epidemic are both vegan and kind of militantly vegan. Like they don't even want me and Susan to be eating meat or drinking milk while they're in the house. Although they've been, they've let up a little bit on us, but they, <laughs> you know, they've been really appealing to our consciousness about eating meat and dairy. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I've been trying to find some middle ground with them and some ways that we can enjoy this together. By the way, we've had amazing vegan meals every night of the epidemic. That's one, one of the best things about this is the vegan cooking we've been doing. Nice. But, um, Max and I are both big fans of tea, but of course he can't have milk in his tea. So uh, we've he's experimented with all the different kinds of um, milk substitutes, and he's finally settled on oat milk, which of course wasn't available. Oat milk is one of the more recent milk substitutes, and you couldn't get it in Boston until about a year ago. So we would go to New York, and you could get it. And then we'd come back here, and it just wasn't available on the shelves. So now we're buying Oatly, and you know he has the oat milk in the fridge. But I thought it's actually really easy to make oat milk. It really is just soaking oats overnight in water and then blending them up with some more water and straining them through a cheesecloth bag and you, you have free oat milk because uh, oats are so cheap. So I thought that'd be a fun thing, project for us to do together. So we have started doing that, but we didn't have a, um, a good bag for the straining part. It's the one thing we were missing. Mm -hmm. So I bought a bag from a um, 
I did a lot of research again, and I bought a bag from a company with a terrible name of Things and Thoughts, which is just a <laughs> crappy brand name. But um, they have this bag called the Amazing 100% Organic Nut Milk Bag, and it's really great for the following reasons. One, it's really strong um, organic cheesecloth, so you can't – the thing about squeezing – I don't know if you guys have done this before, but when you're squeezing the oats um, – the oat milk through the bag, you're trying to keep all the particulate matter right out of your final product. So you have mm-hmm. to have these little, tiny little holes, but it's hard to, you have to put a lot of pressure on the bag to get the, the, the liquid out. So it's really easy to kind of pop the seams and destroy these things. So you want like right. a double stitched, really strong cloth bag. So that's, that's what this is so far. The other thing I like about it that's really clever is that the seam is on the outside of the bag. They, they just basically sewed the bag and then instead of flipping it inside out, they just left it that way. Mm-hmm. And what's cool about that is you don't get the particulate matter into the seam, so it's easier to oh, clean. Yeah, that's nice. Right. Yeah. That's good. And yet the problem I've had with these kinds of bags is that I always end up like choking the, the filter, the mesh, and it's mm-hmm. nothing comes through. Or like you said, then it will pop. So if this is like sewn well, that's... That's really important. Yeah. I mean, we've run up against that a little bit too and sort of we're still experimenting with how do you – basically, I think what you have to do is kind of not do – not pour all your your liquid in there at once. Just do it in batches kind of and then mm-hmm. clean it sort of in between batches probably. That's yeah. what we're learning. Yeah. So you soak – how long do you soak the oats overnight? Just overnight, yeah. Just a cup you know, a cup of oats or two cups of oats, mm-hmm. however much you want to make. And then in the morning, you um, – Pour it into a colander and rinse it off to get all the kind of gluteny, slimy stuff off. Because that's what's mm-hmm. gross about oat milk is the sliminess. Mm-hmm. So you, you totally clean it off and you feel kind of weird about it because you're seeing all this like white liquid going down the drain. You're like, isn't that the oat milk that I want? Well, you just <laughs> let it go. But you, you don't want the slimy stuff. And then you add more water and you put it in a blender. Um, and for like two minutes, you have to blend it like a lot. Like if you do it for like two minutes straight and you, the smoke is rising out of the blender and you can smell like you know, hot, heated up metal at that point, it's probably blended enough. Whoa. To, uh, yeah. And do you use um, raw oats or stone ground mm-hmm. oats? Or are they ground? Need, yeah. You need to use, um, you don't want to use like quick oats. You need to use like right. steel cut or rolled yeah. oats. And you don't cook them first? No. Do you? Okay. And then, no. so, so you're actually pulverizing the oats themselves. So you don't have like leftover oats that you could eat. There is this matter that's left over afterwards, and they say that you can use it for like baking. Like maybe if you were making some chocolate chip cookies, you could throw it in there, and it would work. I don't know what else you could use it for. Mm-hmm. It's mostly fiber of some sort, I would guess. Yeah, and supposedly you can also make um, you can do celery juicing and make yogurt and do cold brew coffee and all kinds of things with this bag. Uh, I've only used it for the oat mm-hmm. milk. That looks good, and it's like ten bucks. Yeah, good price. You could use it for making tofu, tofu, things like that, where you're straining um, soaked soy soybeans. Mm-hmm. I've never made tofu. We're eating tons yeah. of it. Maybe. It's the same thing. It's you take soybeans, you soak it, you grind them up, mm-hmm. you squeeze out the milk, you, you curdle it with a little bit of powdered something. Mm-hmm. I forget what it is. And is it, it like calcium carbonate or something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, there's your tofu. That is that easy? Huh? I have to do yeah. it. Yeah, try it. Yeah, me too. When I was a yes. kid, I'm, Mark and I had the same age. When I was a kid in the late 70s, my father got remarried to a woman who was really into tofu and, you know, she didn't use a, the, the, the uh, clothes dryer and she had she was into cl- cloth diapers for her children and she was super grunchy in granola and it, she like, I, it freaked me out. I didn't like any of that stuff. I thought everything was crazy and i was embarrassed and it was horrible and now of course i'm into all that stuff <laughs> so i have to like apologize to my stepmother all the time for the way i reacted at the time <laughs> and and is she still into it or has she moved on to oh uh... yeah no she is totally into it like she okay. the, the the dryer the clothes dryer that was in the house when they moved in 30 years ago was still there unplugged never been used you know what i mean she just it's all yeah. out on the porch wow that's so cool yep a woman after kevin's heart yeah <laughs> She didn't. Um, she didn't go out and poop on cardboard like Evan. But other than that, everything. Else was <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite stunts of yours. Of, of mine? Yeah, wasn't that you? No. What? I thought that was you. I'm sorry. I'm no. aligning you. I thought it was you who like did an experiment of seeing if you could just poop on a big cardboard piece of cardboard in your backyard for a year it's instead a of flushing it. 
No, yeah. no. I think just want to use less water or something. <laughs> I have to so say that with you, Kevin. Oh, no, I, well, I don't know where that maybe, came from. Maybe but, it was uh, Howard. That's something Howard might try. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's not something I've tried. But now that you've given me the idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just go get a refrigerator box from the Maytag store and you're all set. You're in business. Um, I mean, you know, where, of course, you know, in China, recycling your, your waste is a time-honored thing. They have honey mm-hmm. pots. And in, uh, even in even in cities today, there are places that don't have indoor plumbing, so they have the honey pots lining the streets, and they have a guy come down the morning with a, a cart, and they load the they're, they're usually kind of red wooden pots, chamber pots, right? And so mm-hmm. they 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 um, unload them, and then they take them to these big vats, and they're fermented, and then put back onto the fields. And um, there's actually a saying in Chinese about not. You don't want to kind of give your your treasures away to your neighbor. You want to keep you want to keep it all your fellows. Basically, you want to poo in your own yard. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it's funny that. that you say funny that you say that because my dad is really into um, mulching leaves. It's almost like his only hobby, I think. <laughs> and so he 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 has like ten different um, comp- compost you know bins in the backyard just for leaves, and he goes out and pees in them all the time because yeah. he wants to add the nitrogen. So he's really I, proud of his project. I, I, I pee in our garden, but it drives my wife crazy. But <laughs> is it to is it for for fertilizing or to keep coyotes away or or <laughs> well, critters away? We have a drought here yeah. in North Cal- Northern mm-hmm. California, so it's it's a cheap way to water. Oh, interesting! Yeah, well, and it has nitrogen, you know. Yeah, uh-huh. nitrogen. It has some phosphorus, so there's a little bit of trace ones. And if you if you keep it moving, if you don't do it in the same spot, there's no issues of smell. Yeah, sure. That's really cool. I think right. you start doing it, Mark. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I think you start doing it. Carlos is going to be into that. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I have a new activity during the pandemic. Um, so I also, I I just remembered you are a big game, like tabletop game player. And so you have a, a recommendation for a, a game. Yeah, although it's by no means like a new game. It's actually one of the most popular games out there. But I don't if you guys haven't talked about it before on your No, we um, never have. We don't, I don't know okay. anything about it. So start from ground okay. zero. Yeah. So yeah, I do like I'm not a, a bowl game expert, but I do love them and I especially love the kind of, you know, German revolution of 15, 20 years ago now of all what the, was kind the of, what was the German revolution? You know, Catan and um you know, these kind of more complex uh, game, like cooperative games and more complex games that just kind of blew the roof off of Risk and Clue and, you know, all the older. And, and, and they were games. they were new because they were complex and collaborative. They're more complex, you know, beautifully um, designed and created. Um, the game mechanics were much more, you know, complicated and strategic. So they're kind of really aimed at adults and they take, you know, they can take hours to play. Is this um, like what's being called Euro games? It's, Euro games probably is another word for it. Yeah, like Ticket to Ride, Carcassonne, exactly. Settlers of Catan. Those, yes, those, those, are the, those are the kind of famous. And is Dominion ones. Dominion one of those? Dominion, I don't think it's actually a European game, but it is in that um, space. And in fact, when it came out in two thousand eight, it was debuted at this big German um, board game festival. They have this four day long board game fair in Germany, the biggest board game fair in the world called spiel i think and uh it won that year so it was immediately popular so i'm not bringing new news here it's been around for 12 years um there are tons of it's tons of um expansion decks and so forth but here's here here, let me just back up a little and say my niece um who's up sheltering up in vermont was feeling very kind of isolated um you know when all this when the epidemic first happened and she was with roommates she didn't know very well and her family was in montana and so we were trying to find ways to connect with her online and we were watching movies through Netflix party and so forth. And she said, you want to play dominion online? So dominion, um, let me, now let me describe the game. It's a, it's a, it's a deck building game. So you have, um, I think it comes with like 500 cards in a box or something. So it looks really frightening when you first get it mm. and it's kind of off putting, but you divide into these sort of 25 decks of, um, types of cards that you, things that you can buy. So these actions and um, things that you can do. And then you also have like gold, silver, and copper coins. And you have um, estates that you're trying to buy. So it's basically like a medieval estate um, competition is the kind of conceit of it, where you are kind of monarchs of your own little kingdoms. You're trying to build the biggest kingdom before um, certain resources run out. And whoever has the most estates at the end wins. 
And so you ha you ha you start. The nice thing about it is that unlike Magic: The Gathering or something, it doesn't matter. Which is another kind of deck building game. You can't sort of buy your way to um, success in that game. With Magic, you can just buy really awesome cards and then beat everybody who plays against you. In this game, everybody starts with the same thing every time. You all start with just a few copper coins and a couple of estates. And then each when each turn comes around, you decide whether you want to buy cards that give you actions that you can do, or do you want to buy estates? And you have to kind of make these decisions. And um, it's what's the mechanics are what's called, you know, so there's deck building, there's delayed purchase because you don't get to use your uh, cards right away. You're kind of putting them back into your discard pile and they circle their way back into your deck eventually. Um, hand management, because you're trying to decide what the smartest thing to do in each of your moves is. And uh, take that as another um, mechanic, which is where you, you can actually like take action against people and you can sick curses on them or you can sick a militia or a bandit on, on your opponents. And it's it's a it's a fun game that's not as complex as it sounds. Even though there's 500 cards, it's actually pretty easy to learn and pretty quick to play. My wife, who is our epidemic quartermaster, in that she's like, really really good at thinking about what supplies you need and how we're going to get them in a safe way and how we're going to kind of um, use our food so it doesn't get rotten you know what i mean she's been um, she has this unbelievable skill that's kind of sprung forward during the epidemic she's incredible at this game so for people who have that kind of ability to kind of think about resources and the smartest way to you know hoard them and use them in the in at the right time um, this is your game anyway my niece invited us to play dominion online so at uh you could, what's fun about the their online version, it's so slightly clunky, but what's cool about it is that you can experiment with all the different expansion packs without having to buy them yourself. So you're playing the exact game. You can play against bots, um, up to four bots, or you can play against real people, or you can sign up and kind of create your own table and then invite your friends to play. So that's what we were doing with her. And it's the exact same version of the game. It's just an, on, an online version of it. What's nice is that you can try out all these different expansion packs without actually buying them. So it's a cool game, and the online version is really fun as well. Is the online version free? It's free, yeah. There might be some cool. kind of something you can pay for at some point to get mm -hmm. more access to like certain kits or something. Else. But the, I've been playing it for several weeks, and I haven't run into any need to like buy anything yet. Wow. That sounds really good. That's cool. So, And it's a great way to kind of learn the game too, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, I thought I was going to get really good at it by playing it a bunch and, and online and beat my family, but they're all destroying me all the time, so it's not <laughs> working for me. But yes, and I, theoretically. And I see that you have different language options too, which is really including Chinese and Japanese. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an incredibly successful game, uh, so I'm almost embarrassed to be bringing it to this podcast so late in the day. But yes, I think it has a huge online following. There's all kinds of people who write like strategy pages, and there's a wiki for it, and there's books you can buy about how to beat beat it, so it's a there's a well developed kind of fan culture for it. Well, don't be uh, apologize because I didn't know about it at all, mm -hmm. so it's it's news to me. And um, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Dominion Online, that's cool. Yeah, Josh, we just have a couple of minutes to go, so um, let's quickly talk about some of the things that you're kind of working on. Uh, you have an activity kit that was based on your onboard book, and it's called Road Trip. What's that about? Yeah, so um, well, back in 2012, um, I published with some friends. We published a book called Onboard, which was activity family activities, activities for kids sort of aged 8 to 13 that you could do with your parents, which there aren't a lot of books out there like that. There are books sort of for kids to do on their own, and there's books – for kind of parenting books, but there weren't a lot of books for family things to do. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea of the book, and we did a couple of sequels. And then Mindware Games, which is out in Minnesota, asked if we kind of wanted to develop uh, a franchise of activity kits through Mindware. So we've done five now, and the new one that just came out is weirdly um, timely because I think because of the epidemic, people aren't going to be doing foreign travel as much, and there's going to be a lot of road trips this year. Mm -hmm. So we weren't we weren't expecting that when we developed the kit, but basically it's ideas and things that you can do on a on a long car trip. So there's a bingo pad and you know a draw a drawing pad with three different games on it, and there's a big fold out map of America with things that you can find and the stickers you can put on it. And there's a whiteboard to do hangman, and there's conversation starting cards, et cetera, et cetera. And then the whole thing is shaped like a suitcase. And then um, we developed we've designed a bunch of fun. Uh, stickers that you can stick on the outside of the suitcase, like an old fashioned suitcase. So it's basically, um, and then there's a, an activity book inside as well that has a lot of um, 
my favorite games from card games from growing up, as well as ones that we've kind of discovered since then. That looks cool. So it's called the Unboard Road Trip. Yeah, it looks like a little suitcase. Um, tell us about uh, your new uh, website, Semiovox, or is it Semiovox? I don't know. Semiovox. Yeah. So my day job is, I mean, I work for myself, but the, the way I earn a living is as a, as a consulting semiotician to brands and companies and organizations who want to understand kind of how meaning works in the space that they're in. Um, so I do um, semiotic audits of particular, you know, category spaces or cultural spaces, and uh, could that's you, fine. Could you take and, one second to describe <laughs> sure. what a semiotic audit is, because I think I understand those two words, but I don't understand them together. Sure. Uh, well, so I mean, semiotics is trying to understand what are the kind of um, unspoken norms of a particular you know category or cultural space so that what are the ideas being expressed through packaging and advertising uh through um you know social media and websites however brands are communicating how what are the ideas what are the values what are the higher order benefits the emotional benefits being expressed and then um what are the more almost more importantly what are the visual and verbal cues that bring those things to life so what are the colors and typography and facial expressions and um, pack architecture and you know context uh, and tonality and music that bring those ideas and values and benefits to life for you know consumers or people in that space. So a semiotic audit of let's say for example for Luna Bar a couple of years ago we after the women's march they wanted to kind of move more aggressively into a kind of female empowerment space. They were already in a female empowerment space, but that was very kind of self centered and they wanted to move into more community oriented female empowered empowerment space. So our audit would look at um, dozens and dozens of brands and media and blogs and so forth that was a, that were communicating our female empowerment and mapping that whole space out and sort of showing you where you currently are in the map, who else is there on the map, who are you competing with, where are some other spaces you could go to, how, and what could you do to get there? What kind of visual and verbal cues would you have to start doing and stop doing uh, to get to that space? Okay. I understand that. Good. So, um, Semiovox comes out. So that was just the name of my consultancy that I've been started five or six years ago. And then, um, but I, what I missed doing was um, writing about this stuff because I was just using the website as a way to kind of sell my services. But, I, you know, I'm a writer and a journalist and uh, an editor. And so there was kind of a piece missing there for the last five or six years. And I finally relaunched the site several weeks ago to make it more of a website with content on it. So I'm going to be writing and publishing both myself and other writers where we're going to be looking at uh, what things mean. So what, you know, pack design or movies or, you know, um, objects mean as well as how they mean what they mean. Cause that's really what semiotics is not just the what, but the how something means what it means. It's almost like an old blog style. Oh yeah. I'm like the last of the bloggers for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm the kind of guy who gets into something really late and then stays in it too long. Right? <laughs> so like, it's your MO. Come late yeah. and stay way too long. <laughs> yes. I'm like the worst kind of party guest. Yeah. So like with um, Zine Publishing, same thing. Like I got into it, you know, after the glory days are over, after the late, the glory days are sort of the late eighties and I got it into the early nineties and I kept doing it way after everyone else quit. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So, so finally, uh, tell us, so, so another thing that you're working on, let's, let's pick that one, uh, the diamond age, uh, sci-fi series, uh, that you're doing. What is that? Yeah. So, um, back on my other website, Hilo Brow, I've been, um, as you know, writing about adventure novels, and I sort of specialized, I kind of did a special series on what I called radium age science fiction. So I got, I got really into science fiction from the 19, uh, early 1900s to the early 1930s. That was kind of poo-pooed by science fiction fans. People like, they like Orson Welles, and they like um, Jules Verne, and then they jump to Heinlein, you know, and Asimov. But there's a whole three decades in there that people think of just, as just kind of crappy, um, you know, space cadet kind of pulp sci-fi, but there's actually a lot of really good, really smart, really interesting, and really fun science fiction from that period. So I just started writing about Radium Age. I called it Radium Age, and I started writing about Radium Age science fiction. And then I kind of kept going after that. Like I say, I I, I, I uh, come to the party late, and then I keep going. 
So then I wrote a whole series about golden age science fiction. And then I wrote about new wave science fiction of the 60s and 70s. And I was going to stop there. But there's so much good science fiction from the 80s and 90s as well that I decided to give it a name. So I'm calling it Diamond Age after Neil Stevenson's novel. Mm -hmm. And um, I just um, started trying to decide what the 75 best novels of those two decades are as well. So I'm almost done with that project now, too. Oh, wow. So what age are we in now in terms of science fiction? Yeah, I mean, we're in an awesome age. I love the science fiction that's coming out now, but I don't have a name for it. Maybe it might be presumptuous to name it yet. But um, yeah, it's one thing that's amazing about right now is um, how many of the great and most popular science fiction writers not right now are women and people of color. That just mm-hmm. was not happening. Even as late, as late as the 80s and 90s, you just weren't still weren't seeing that. Also, but now it's or, like or, it's or Asian. Or Asian. Or Asian, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so now you're really seeing – it took a long, long time, but you're seeing that genre kind of um, be very diverse now, which is amazing and really good. That's cool. Well, Josh, this has been fun. It was great reconnecting with you after uh, not having you on a podcast for quite a number of years. So uh, it was really great catching up. Thanks so much. Yeah, always fun talking to you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. It's your co-host, Mark. And I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week.